I got this innocuous text from my brother on Friday, December 16th, talking about a game called Fear and Hunger. I had never heard of these games before. I went to look at the Steam page. Oh, oh no. He said, he said the words, the words that are key to my heart. Pathologic vibes. This text exchange, these messages, were an act of violence. I can only assume that this was intended as revenge against me for that time I bullied my brother into buying a Goku skin in Fortnite. These messages sent me down a dark, dark, miserable path. I played Fear and Hunger, and Fear and Hunger 2, Termina. Fear and Hunger is an RPG Maker game released in December 2018. Fear and Hunger 2, Termina, is the sequel, released in December 2022. The first game is a fantasy dungeon crawler with randomized elements, where you pick one of four characters, each corresponding to a class, and delve into the dungeon of fear and hunger. The gameplay revolves around keeping several plates spinning at once, as you try to conserve your resources, but also have to deal with constantly depleting hunger and sanity meters, while also fighting extremely dangerous enemies and exploring the dungeon. Eventually, you wind up in the middle of a cosmic horror story, a puppet in a complicated chess game being played between the gods themselves. The second game departs from its dungeon crawler roots, instead taking heavy, heavy inspiration from Silent Hill 1, dropping you in an expansive and dangerous foggy town, yours to freely explore. The second game has a much larger scope with eight playable characters, many more skills, and a much larger world. Set in 1942, just a few months after the Second Great War, your chosen character arrives in the town of Preheval, alongside 13 others, only to find that the town is enshrouded by a supernatural fog, and the people of the town have gone mad. You're told that the 14 of you have been chosen by the Moon God to partake in a festival, a battle royale. You have three days to kill each other, and if more than one is left standing, something unspeakable will happen. And look, if that sounds interesting to you, any of that, then before you go any further in this video, these games are cheap. The first one is eight bucks, the second one is 12. Take the content warnings seriously, but the TLDR for this video is that these games are really special and worth experiencing. I'm not going to talk in too much detail about the story of these games, but I will be talking about the mechanics of the game and how they can be manipulated. And that's the more important type of spoiler for this type of game anyway. Figuring out what the hell is going on is a lot of the joy of the experience, so going in blind is best. These games are brutal. They are mean, and they are impenetrable. But I am here to tell you that once I made it through to the other side, I found it worth it. Stop the video, go check the games out, go with God. If you want more to go on than that, though, well... I spent about 50 hours in these games put together, I managed to get the A ending, the true ending if you will, in both, and I would like to talk about what these games are, why they're a miserable, tedious, frustrating experience, and why I stuck with them anyway. If you're thinking about playing the games but want a better understanding of what you're getting into first, if you've tried the games and bounced off them and want to know why the hell anyone would bother with them, or if you know the games aren't for you, but want to find out what makes them special secondhand, this video is made with you in mind. And don't worry, I'll be talking in detail about the game, but I've deliberately written this video to avoid mentioning some of the game's meaner and more interesting twists, so even if you watch this video, trust that these games will have plenty of surprises in store. Are the Fear and Hunger games good? I don't know, but I don't like good games, I like interesting games. There are few games I've played in recent years as interesting as Fear and Hunger. The way we talk about difficulty in games is broken, and it has been for a long time. Sekiro is a hard game. Shin Megami Tensei III Nocturne is a hard game. The mythic raids in World of Warcraft, as well as other MMOs, make it a hard game. I want to be the guy, the movie, the game is a hard game. All of these statements are true, but they all mean something completely different. Sekiro is hard because it demands 
extreme focus for long durations mixed with honed twitch reflexes. Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne, on the other hand, doesn't require any twitch reflexes at all. Rather, it demands you to strategically build a party, and to understand how to manipulate many different status effects and combat systems to your advantage, as well as, when all else fails, some good old-fashioned level grinding. Raiding is hard not because any one action is especially challenging, but because it demands coordination and correct execution of numerous different actions from not just one person, but many. I Wanna Be The Guy is hard not only because of demanding technical execution, but because it's an endurance test, as well as a test of memory, as there are many, many unfair and unforeseeable instant deaths throughout the game, which require trial and error to avoid. All of these games can accurately be described as hard, but simply calling them hard doesn't actually tell you anything about them. It's easy to say that Fear and Hunger is hard or brutal and leave it at that, because it's true. Fear and Hunger and its sequel are hard games. They are difficult. That's an accurate description, but at the same time, they're very easy if you already know what you're doing. I think a better way to describe Fear and Hunger is unfair. A lot of praise gets thrown at difficult games for being fair. When people talk about why Dark Souls is so good, they describe it as being fair. The world feels cohesive, there is a set of rules this game operates by, and those rules apply to bosses every bit as much as they apply to the player. An example of this is the Taurus Demon from the first Dark Souls, or the Dragon Rider boss from the second. Both bosses are early, daunting challenges, which can be completely avoided if the boss just so happens to slip and fall from its precarious arena. Because if the player can die from that, so too can a boss. Fear and Hunger is not a fair game. It does not pretend to be a fair game. It is not interested in being a fair game to such an obvious degree that I don't think it's reasonable to even criticize it for being unfair. Criticizing Fear and Hunger for being unfair would be like criticizing Devil May Cry for not being a plastic instrument-based rhythm game like Rock Band or Guitar Hero. That simply isn't what the game is trying to be. Although Fear and Hunger is built in RPG Maker and uses a familiar turn-based combat interface, it isn't trying to emulate Final Fantasy or Earthbound or any of the other JRPGs which RPG Maker is typically used to imitate. Rather, what Fear and Hunger is trying to be is a classic survival horror experience, a la classic Resident Evil or Silent Hill. There is no experience point system in Fear and Hunger. Killing an enemy won't progress your character in any meaningful way unless they happen to have a specific item you know you want. What it will do, like in a Resident Evil game, is take that enemy out of the equation for the rest of the game. If there's a zombie in a hallway you know you're going to frequent in Resident Evil 1, then it's probably worth using up resources to take that enemy out, so you don't have to spend time avoiding him every time you walk down that hallway. On the flip side, if there's a zombie in some obscure corner you only need to visit once, then you can give yourself an advantage by not spending any resources on him, and merely kite him around to grab whatever you need and leave. In Resident Evil, the main resources you are spending is ammunition and health, while in Fear and Hunger, your main resources are hunger, body, and mind. Body is the most traditional of these three resources. It's your hit points. You start with 100 max body, and you will probably end with 100 max body, unless you've gotten an ailment like a broken arm or severe hunger that has reduced that total. Hunger is a ticking clock that puts pressure on you, forcing you to move forward and continue scavenging for more items. Unless you're in a pause screen, your hunger is always going down, and as you get hungrier, your character will get progressively weaker, dealing less damage and, in the later stages, being too weak to even stand, and finally killing them if they fully starve. Keeping your character well-fed has the obvious advantage of being more competent and useful, but it also often means using that food in a less than efficient way. Let's say you have some party member who needs to remove 30 points of hunger, but the only food you have at the moment is some extremely useful grilled meat that removes 60 points of hunger. 
the optimal thing to do from a resource management perspective would be to hold on to that grilled meat until that party member hits 60 points of hunger. But around that 30 point mark is where your character first starts to get meaningfully weaker. Waiting and trying to progress until you hit that 60 points of hunger mark might be the difference between dealing the killing blow on a miniboss and having that miniboss kill you and send you back to a save you made an hour earlier. But maybe you have four raw eggs, as well as the grilled meat, and each of those eggs removes seven points of hunger. It might be more efficient to use those raw eggs instead, but if combined with other raw ingredients, each of those eggs could be used to craft another, much more useful food item instead, the meat pie, which restores a whopping 90 points of hunger. Is it worth using the grilled meat and wasting 30 points of food on the chance that you find other ingredients to combine with the eggs, not to mention the cookbook which teaches you the recipe, and end up with far more food in the long run, or should you just use the eggs and keep the grilled meat for a pinch later on? This is compounded by the game allowing you to have up to four party members. Each party member you have is a huge boon, giving you another damage source, as well as having their own pool of 100 hit points, which lets damage dealt by enemies spread out and naturally mitigates the difficulty. But if you've got two party members, that's twice as much food you'll need to keep your party alive. If you have four party members, that's four times as much. The third resource you need to keep on top of is Mind, which acts as a shared sanity meter and mana pool. Unsettling actions, particularly traveling in the darkness, will constantly drain your mind, which starts at a maximum of 100 points, like body, and can be refilled by indulging in vices, drinking beer and liquor, or smoking tobacco and opium. You can mitigate some factors of mind loss, like darkness, by using limited consumables like torches and flint and tinder. If there's a torch hanging on the wall, you can give yourself a tiny little permanent safe zone where your mind won't drain as quickly by using a flint and tinder, or you can pick that torch up and carry it with you for a short time until it burns out. If you want to tackle some of the game's later challenges, you'll want to engage in the game's spell system, as magic can be an incredibly valuable tool for both healing your party and dealing major damage. The problem is that casting spells eats massive amounts of your mind away. A single cast might trivialize a difficult encounter, but it'll also cost you 20 or 30 points of your mind, which I'll say again, you only have 100 of. Is it worth casting that spell, turning your character into a sort of machine that turns beer into fireballs, or should you save those resources for the late game when you might need them more? Fear and Hunger is absolutely full of little decisions like this, Hundreds of little trade-offs, each one pretty minor and inconsequential in a vacuum, but building to a constant source of stress and tension, which is only enhanced by how savage the combat can be. The big gimmick of Fear and Hunger's combat system is strategic dismemberment. Nearly every enemy in the game is made up of multiple parts, torso, arms, legs, head, and so on. These parts often get their own turn in combat, with their own unique actions. One of the few things the game does purely in the player's favor is that combat always begins with the player's action first. If you see an enemy sprite in combat holding a weapon, you can target the arm that weapon is held in to attempt to destroy it first, to keep them from destroying you on their first turn. If you want to play it really safe, you can just destroy both of their arms before attacking their center of mass leaving them unable to do anything but uselessly tackle you with their armless torso, dealing a relatively tiny amount of damage. Of course, you could also risk it and go straight for the headshot. Enemy heads typically have very little health, so one good hit can one-shot even a dangerous enemy, but your accuracy is going to be much, much lower than trying to attack their body. All of this sounds pretty interesting, right? You can see how that system could be used in your favor. Well, here's the bad news. Most of that applies to you, too. Your player character starts out with two arms and two legs. If an enemy has a bladed weapon and they hit you with it, there's a very good chance they're going to randomly cut off one of those limbs. Which is a lot worse for you than it is for them, because you have to play the rest of the game like that. That's right, if you lose an arm, 
that arm's gone. If you lose a leg, that leg is gone. There's no way to regain a lost limb, so if you get unlucky and lose an arm, you're going to have to make the call whether you want to reload or keep going. And that's all the more painful a decision if your last save was an hour ago or longer. Generally speaking, you can kind of get by losing a single arm and a single leg each. Losing a single arm will keep you from using many of the game's more powerful two-handed weapons, as well as using an offhand shield. And losing a single leg, as far as I can tell, doesn't actually do anything. But losing both of your legs means you'll be spending the rest of the game crawling at a painfully slow pace. And losing both of your arms means you'll lose your ability to hold anything. If you really screw up and lose all four limbs, the game will tell you you're unable to do anything, and ask if you want to stop breathing. Oh, and your eyes can take damage too. If that happens, you'll be blinded, meaning the game screen will be entirely black for the rest of the game, which obviously is just as bad as a game over. Does that sound harsh? Well, don't worry, I actually lied. You can regain all of your lost limbs for your entire party, and replenish all of your resources on top of that. All you have to do is find a hidden NPC behind a puzzle late in the game, and then make a deal with the devil. All of that sounds punishing, but manageable. Let's make it all worse, why don't we? When I tell you that on top of everything else, Fear and Hunger has a heaping helping of RNG in it. I wouldn't call Fear and Hunger a roguelike, but I've seen others use that description, and I see why. There is an element of randomness to the very design of the dungeon itself. From what I can tell, I don't think the game's environments are themselves procedurally generated. Rather, it seems like each of the game's areas has a set number of possible layouts, and when you start a new game, the entire game is seeded to choose from each of these layouts. Within a single run of the game, the layout of the dungeon will never change, even if you reload from the very beginning and run to the very end again. Starting a new game, however, will result in a different dungeon layout entirely, which gives the game a lot of replayability, but also makes figuring out where exactly you need to go all the more difficult. There's not a lot of documentation or discussion of this game online compared to most games, and just figuring out where I was supposed to go and what I was supposed to do to progress was what I found overall most challenging. I often felt like I'd exhausted my options and couldn't figure out where I was meant to go next, spending an hour walking through the same environments while my hunger and mind were constantly ticking down, only to find that I'd overlooked a door somewhere. That's not the only randomized element of the game, though. As a survival horror game, there is a loot economy to what you find. You walk through the dungeon looting everything inside, crates, barrels, and if you're lucky, treasure chests. All of this loot is random. If you're lucky, maybe you'll find some arm guards early on, which prevent whoever's wearing them from having their arms cut off. If you're unlucky, Maybe you just won't get any raw meat to grill or beer to drink, and will find your resources completely depleted at the game's halfway point, forcing you to start over. Does that sound frustrating? Don't worry, things get much worse. One of the game's core mechanics is a literal coin flip. Many actions in the game will ask you, heads or tails? Sometimes this is a fairly low-stakes decision. For example, will you get better or worse treasure out of a chest? More often, though, it'll be an enemy using a one-hit kill attack. One last thing. Do you notice how I haven't mentioned saving the game yet? That's because that, too, is reliant on Lady Luck. One of the things you can randomly loot off of bookcases is a Book of Enlightenment, which, when read, will let you save your game. These are consumed on use. If you get unlucky and never find one, which is pretty likely they're a rare item, there is one other way of saving and all you have to do is sleep in a bed. Oh, and win a coin flip, because if you lose that coin flip, instead of saving, the game will spawn an elite enemy who will most likely wipe your party. There are a few special beds in the game, one early on that gives you a guaranteed save game, but only once before it becomes a coin flip like every other bed, and one in an extremely late game area which can be reused as many times as you like. 
Except the first time you use it when you'll have to fight a boss in a dream realm, the Skin Granny. Because of how limited saves are as a resource, you won't be saving often. This is mitigated by the fact that Fear and Hunger is, in a sense, a pretty short game. My final save file I got the game's true ending with was between 3 and 4 hours. My time played overall, on the other hand, was north of 12 hours, both because of my many, many, many failed attempts not counting towards that save clock, and because I restarted three times. All of this is what people mean when they say fear and hunger is hard. That one word is used as shorthand for a half dozen complicated interconnected systems. The challenge of fear and hunger doesn't come from requiring twitch reflexes, there are very few moments in the game which test that at all. Rather, the challenge in fear and hunger comes from endurance, being willing to trial and error your way through dozens of attempts, and asking you to internalize the complicated systems working against you until you're able to progress. This is the kind of game where, by the end of it, it feels easy, because you've essentially taken a class on how to play it. You've earned a degree in Fear and Hunger, a PhD in dungeon crawling. All of this begs the question, though. Why would you put up with any of that? There are a million other games out there. A million other RPG Maker games, even. Why would anyone bother approaching a game that's so hostile, so clearly working against you at every turn? While I don't consider Fear and Hunger to be a roguelike, it is best approached with that same mentality. Your most valuable resource in Fear and Hunger isn't body, it isn't mind, it isn't food, it isn't even saves. The most valuable resource in Fear and Hunger is knowledge. A game over is only a true fail state if you didn't learn anything from that attempt, and if you give up. Your character begins Fear and Hunger looking for a character named Lagarde, who is being held in the dungeon. The first time I reached Lagarde, he was dead, because I'd taken too long. This save file was around two hours in, and if you don't reach Lagarde in the first hour, he's going to be dead, which also locks you out of one of the game's endings. When I realized what had happened, I restarted. I could have kept going, it turns out I even could have still gotten the game's true ending, but it was nagging at me. With everything I knew, even though it had taken me six hours of real time to reach Lagarde the first time, getting to him in the first hour just seemed so possible. Once I restarted, I made it to him in 34 minutes. What I got in return was the most powerful party member I'd come across so far, which rounded out the party of four I ended up taking through the rest of the game. That, that is why you would want to play Fear and Hunger. The experience of playing Fear and Hunger is learning these systems inside and out, and figuring out how to manipulate them to tip the scales in your favor. Getting Lagarde is one example of that, but not the only one. There are many things in Fear and Hunger which initially seem useless or inconsequential, but if you figure out how to use them, they can be used to break the game wide open. A great example of this is Rotten Meat. You can find Rotten Meat all over the game. You'll end up with tons of it just by naturally playing the game. It will restore a little bit of hunger, but it's rotten, so it'll also poison anyone who eats it, which requires another rarer consumable to heal. This means it's really only useful as an absolute last resort if you're out of everything else to eat, and if you're at that point, you're probably better off just restarting anyway. This makes it a fundamentally worthless item. When you get it out of random loot, you may as well have gotten nothing at all. In the relatively early portions of the game, you'll find yourself in a large, intimidating cavern full of enemies. Suddenly, you'll find yourself being charged by some kind of demonic wolf named Moonless. For all the world, this seems like a boss, or at least mini-boss, encounter. It's a named enemy with a unique, intimidating design. I was super scared when I first encountered Moonless. I set my party to attack it, and killed it on the first turn. Well, that's weird. This game is full of weird stuff like that. So if you're like me, you put Moonless out of your mind and move on. I guess that was just some weird one-off encounter. It felt vaguely like I was missing something, but I was honestly just glad to take the win and move onward. It turns out I was missing something. I was missing a very big something. 
See, right from the beginning of the game, you have talk listed as an action in combat, allowing you to talk to enemies like you can in games like Undertale or Shin Megami Tensei. This almost always results in getting a little lore blurb, followed by your enemy getting a free action. Which, I'll remind you, can be absolutely devastating, especially if they have a bladed weapon. Because of this, I ended up using talk a few times early on, writing it off as either something for lore purposes, or just a joke at the player's expense, and then completely forgot about it. If you use this seemingly useless talk action in your first turn on the Moonless fight, a fight that seems inconsequential, you'll get the option to feed rotten meat, itself a worthless item, to Moonless. If you do that, you'll befriend a Moonless, and get yourself a new party member. While Moonless isn't the most useful party member in the game, Moonless has one big advantage over others. Moonless can eat rotten meat, and will not get any of the downsides of it. You can basically take this item that's completely useless otherwise, and use it to keep Moonless fed for the rest of the game. More importantly, that's one less way you have to split all the other food in the game. So you can still have a full party, while only splitting food three ways instead of four. That can make a huge difference, and that extra food can go a long way. While you can't directly control Moonless in combat, Moonless also comes with the advantage of getting an extra action in between each turn. And her basic attack causes bleeding. Plus, she's immune to enemies poisoning her. Once you figure all of this out, you've taken a useless item, the rotten meat, a useless action, talking, and an inconsequential encounter, the fight against Moonless, and used them to gain a huge advantage that will benefit you for the entire rest of the game. My favorite example of all, though, is the girl. In one of the game's very first rooms, you find a cage holding a young girl. If you use a small key, which is of course another of the game's randomly dropped consumable items, or pick the lock on the cage, you're able to add the girl to your party. She'll likely be the first party member you find, and she's completely useless. She's unarmed and deals a whopping zero damage even to the most basic enemies with her attack. She doesn't come with any special skills because she's a little girl. She doesn't say anything when you talk to her, so she's not even good for any lore. At best, she has her own pool of 100 body, so enemies might attack her instead of your player character. So she works as a meat shield. Otherwise, she's completely worthless. Right? In a room just a little later on, you can find a giant amalgamation of bodies that have formed a fearsome creature called the Human Hydra. When you encounter the Human Hydra, it tells you to bring it a human sacrifice. Of course, the girl will work. So once you finally get the girl, you bring her to the Human Hydra. And you know what you get in return? Absolutely nothing. Okay, so... Clearly, this is being used to teach the player a lesson. Just because you can do something in this game doesn't mean you're going to get a reward or progress for it, in a relatively low-stakes way by only costing the player a worthless joke party member. That's probably what you'll think until later on, when you progress deeper into the game and first encounter Pocket Cat. Pocket Cat is a merchant who will sell some incredibly powerful items, ones which can let you jump the curve and get a huge advantage while you're still barely scraping by for every tiny advantage you can get. The thing is, Pocket Cat doesn't exchange things for money, like other merchants you've encountered. Pocket Cat will trade you one of his powerful items in exchange for human children. Oops! If you still have the girl with you, then this can be a huge power boost that will make the next section of the game, one of the most challenging parts of the game, so much easier. So obviously, that's the real use for the girl, right? If you can stomach literally selling a child to an extremely shady merchant, you can get a huge leg up. Remember how I said earlier that you could heal your lost limbs exactly once? Well... That's another thing the girl can be exchanged for. See, in the late game, there's a hidden room behind a puzzle that has a jellyfish creature called the Lady of the Moon. Much like Moonless, this seems like it'll be another unique mini-boss encounter, but if you think to talk to the Lady of the Moon instead, and you've carried the girl with you all this way, 
she'll make you an offer. The moon god, Rare, wants the girl, and if you agree to give this jellyfish monster the girl, she'll fully heal your entire party, and even restore all of their lost limbs. Huh. Weird how the moon god wants this random little girl. I wonder if there's something more significant to- No, probably not. So, is that the girl's real use? She's dead weight, you end up sacrificing a party slot for her, but in exchange, you can use her as a commodity to be traded for some of the most useful goods and services in the entire game? Nope! You monster! Don't trade this girl to Pocket Cat! How could you do that to her? She's also a viable and extremely useful party member. Not far from where you first find the girl, there's a hidden courtyard. Laying in the courtyard is a discarded dagger. It's not a useful weapon to your character, you won't even bother picking it up normally, but if you've got the girl in tow, then you'll realize this weapon is actually just her size, which will let her deal damage to enemies. It's not a lot of damage, but it can still be the difference between dealing a killing blow and getting your arms chopped off. With how low the health pool on heads is, it can also be viable to just have her target enemy heads while you fight them strategically as normal. If she misses, no big deal, you're just fighting an enemy like normal. If she hits the headshot though, Yahtzee. There are other, more powerful party member options later on, but we're not done with the girl yet. See, if you can find the altar that is used to spend soul stones, the randomly dropped item used to gain skill points, you can instead spend one of those soul stones to curse the girl's dagger. Doing that will hugely increase her damage, and while her dagger will never be as powerful as the other party member's weapons later on, cursed items and magic are the only thing which can deal damage to ghostly enemies, allowing the girl to have a super useful niche in combat. Oh, and speaking of magic, remember how I said she didn't start with any special skills? That's true, but she can learn every spell in the entire game. By the end of my playthrough, she was my most powerful party member just by virtue of being a powerful mage. Actually, I think any character can learn any spell, but the reason I opted to prioritize giving my spells to her was because where my other party members already had their own niche as soon as they joined, she was such a blank slate, it let me make her as viable as any of my other three members. If you've started playing the game, you might have noticed there's another item you can give the girl, the Peculiar Doll. And you might be wondering, does that do anything? Yes. Yes, it does. No, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Put these things together. Speedrunning the game's early portions to get a powerful knight, recruiting Moonless to gain an advantage in resources, and turning a weak little girl into a powerful healer and caster, and suddenly my party felt incredibly powerful, resulting in the game's second half, despite being technically skewed even more against the player, feeling much easier. I had my sea legs, and I beat the game's final boss on my first attempt, although I'd admittedly lost both my arms and both my legs by the time the fight was over. These things aren't the only ways you can tip the scales in your favor. Rather, there are many ways you can do so. These are just three which I'm mentioning. The game's random nature encourages multiple playthroughs as four different characters, with a ton of different viable approaches. I'm not saying this party is anywhere close to a min-maxed perfect playthrough. This isn't a cookbook, a way I'm telling you that you should play the game. These are just some examples of the kind of ways experimentation can be rewarded. Maybe you'll play as a dark priest, and use necromancy to build yourself a ghoul army out of murdered enemies, so that you don't need to use other party members at all. Maybe you'll play as the Barbarian class, and avoid running out of food by opting to eat the flesh of your enemies instead. Maybe you'll do something else entirely, go down a completely different path, and find your own way to work that makes my run seem completely wrong. As I reached the later stages of the game, I sought out videos of other people playing the games, and found completely different approaches to my own. They were doing things I had no idea were even possible, and were having as much success as I was, if not more. That is what makes the game worth playing. That is what's waiting for you on the other side of the brick wall. The game also has a way to mitigate those coin flips I mentioned earlier, the lucky coin system. 
Lucky coins are another valuable treasure you'll encounter throughout the dungeon. While making your choice for a coin flip, holding down shift will let you use a lucky coin, which causes two coins to flip instead of one. And if either lands on your choice, it will treat it as winning the coin flip. This shifts the odds from a true 50-50 to being 75% in your favor, no matter whether you pick heads or tails. Saving these for avoiding one-hit kill attacks, and especially to use when trying to sleep and save the game, made the whole game much more palatable. It's also worth noting, while the game has controller support, and there are a ton of buttons that go unused on a standard controller, it doesn't map the lucky coin to any of the unused buttons by default. I had to manually go map shift to the back buttons on my Steam Deck in order to use this feature. It also never tells you this lucky coin feature exists at all, so you're welcome. While the similarities might not immediately be as apparent as the resource scavenging loop of Resident Evil or the combat system of classic JRPGs, the game which the first Fear and Hunger actually ended up reminding me of the most was Kingsfield IV The Ancient City. Coming from me, that's a massive compliment, by the way. Kingsfield is another dungeon crawler where you start off feeling completely powerless, but end up learning the systems inside and out to the point where you feel like a living god by the end. Much like Fear and Hunger, you spend most of your time in Kingsfield wandering around hallways, looting every crate and barrel you can find, and trying to figure out what you're even supposed to be doing in the first place. The appeal of both of these games is not the story, the narrative in the traditional sense, but rather an impeccable sense of atmosphere. Exploring the dungeons of Kingsfield is about getting lost in a vibe, more than it is overcoming gameplay challenges like more modern from software games. There aren't very many games out there which have that vibe of exploration and of getting lost in quite the way Kingsfield does, but Fear and Hunger nails it, to the point where I wonder whether it was a direct inspiration. The art of Fear and Hunger is excellent, the sprite work is top-notch, and the designs have this eerie Cronenberg-esque body horror flavor that made each terrifying new encounter exciting to come across. This one creature in the overworld is inspired by a hole in a shipwreck. How awesome is that? The game wisely doesn't have random encounters, rather relying on encounters with overworld sprites, and as a result, you only end up fighting the same enemy two or three times at most, at least in a given run, which keeps the designs from growing stale. The sound design is also top-notch. The game is best played with headphones on, to experience the unsettling shrieks and moans that haunt the dungeon. The lore of the world itself and the cosmic horror story which unfolds is also interesting. But I'm the kind of person who will always get lost in a game's lore, and always enjoys having to dig through in-world books and item descriptions to figure out what's going on, so it's possible I'm biased. Something which feels almost like picking on the game, but which I do need to mention in this kind of in-depth look at the game, is that it has its fair share of more technical problems as well. The frame rate really chugs in some places, and I had both games crash a couple times, which given the extreme limitations in place around saves, felt infuriating, especially in one situation where I had just pushed forward past a boss I'd been struggling to kill when it crashed. There are also a handful of spelling or grammar mistakes in the game, which aren't a huge deal, but I did notice. The last thing I need to mention is that Fear and Hunger is adult. There is nudity. There is gore. Dismemberment is a core gameplay mechanic. The game is marked as adult only on Steam for a reason. The nudity and the gore is constant. There are many, many, many enemies in this game with exposed genitalia. I'm not going to mention it again, and I'm not going to show it on screen for obvious reasons, but every time I mention anything in this video, just pretend that I said, and also there's a penis, and that'll give you a pretty good idea of what the experience of this game is like. The nudity is not done without a reason, though, and that reason isn't fan service. At no point in this game did I feel fan serviced. There is nothing sexy in this entire game, not one thing. If you've seen the film Hereditary, then you'll remember a scene near the end of that film that heavily features nudity from a number of older actors. That scene is divisive. 
I know people who have said that scene ruined the movie, that they couldn't take all of the scary things happening seriously when juxtaposed with old naked people smiling and waving at you. But I don't agree. In that scene, the nudity is used for horror. Horror, not jump scares, but a deeper horror, comes from unsettling the audience. Hereditary is a specific type of horror which I like to think of as emotionally devastating rather than scary. Hereditary is a slow burn where you watch this movie just constantly set you on edge with one trick after another, some subtle and some blatant. Watching an actress ugly cry at a funeral isn't scary, but when they do it in Hereditary, it sets you on edge, puts you off balance. Because watching someone grieving so powerfully is an uncomfortable thing to see. The scene in Hereditary which uses nudity is, I think, extremely scary. Because the use of nudity is just one more thing that's put you off balance. The final few minutes of Hereditary feel like you're watching the movie lose its mind, and the unexpected use of nudity in the context of, essentially, a home invasion is so unexpected that I find it makes the other things happening in that scene all the scarier. This is what Fear and Hunger uses nudity for, too. Horror. Take, for example, the guards at the very beginning of the game, one of the first enemies you're likely to encounter. Being clothed is a sign of higher reason, a sign of rationality, of humanity. Animals don't wear clothes, people do. When you find these horrible Cronenberg-esque monstrosities that were clearly once human, but now they're just rocking out with their uh, stingers out, running at you with a large cleaver, that's a sign that immediately conveys something has gone very wrong. Something very bad has happened, which has robbed them of that reason, that humanity. To put it another way, imagine you were standing in the street and someone started sprinting at you with a butcher's knife. Are you going to be less afraid of them if they aren't wearing pants? You're not going to think through that entire thought process when you first see the guard. But that's the thing, you don't have to. It's instinctive and unsettling. Just one more thing to put you off balance. One more thing that adds to the sense of being overwhelmed. The flip side of this, though, is the elephant in the room when talking about this game. I've rewritten this portion of my script several times because it's really hard to talk about this, both because I want to be respectful of a sensitive topic and because it's a topic YouTube gets angry at you when you talk about. So here goes, let's see if I can say this without YouTube yelling at me. Fear and Hunger contains numerous explicit scenes depicting graphic sexual violence. A certain portion of the audience for this video will already know, just from what little I've said, that this is a complete deal breaker for them experiencing this game. I think that sucks. I think it sucks that this game is exclusionary in that way when it didn't need to be. That's why I need to bring it up here, because regardless of whatever positive things I have to say about the game and its merits, those people deserve to know what they're walking into. And be able to make an informed decision to steer clear. I want to criticize these scenes and how they are used in the game because I think that they are used badly, but whatever other criticisms I have for how these are used is secondary. Please understand that's why I'm saying this part first. Those other criticisms, though, are worth bringing up because I think these scenes are a net negative on the experience, even as someone who isn't particularly sensitive to that subject. This isn't a game about trying to say something, whether that's something insightful or stupid, about the topic. Unlike the nudity being used to accentuate the uncanny horror of the game, I don't think these scenes are additive. At all. In fact, I found them to detract from the effectiveness of the horror. Not only because of their tasteless and gratuitous nature, but because they commit one of the cardinal sins of horror. They show too much. A tasteful cutaway in horror doesn't only serve to be, well, tasteful. They allow the viewer's mind to fill in the blanks. 
One of the tricks of horror, especially low-budget horror, is that the human brain will always come up with something far more terrifying than what you can show. The trick to horror is knowing how far to go, what to show explicitly, and what to keep just out of view. I'm not saying the best horror shows nothing. I genuinely don't believe that, and I find horror media that never lets you see the monster at all really lame. This is a balancing act. Show too little, and the audience won't be given enough to go on to really let their imagination run wild. Show too much, though, and you diffuse the tension, especially when you have a limited budget and limited resources. If the point of these scenes is a scary payoff for making a gameplay mistake, positive punishment, if you will, then it actually had the opposite effect for me. It made many monsters and many moments less scary when I realized the only consequence for playing badly would be watching the overhead sprites perform a lame pantomime. On the plus side, it seems like the game's creator might have gotten this feedback from other people between the first and the second game and taken it to heart, because in my entire playthrough of the second game, which I played through as Marina, I didn't encounter a single such scene. That alone makes the second game an easier one to recommend than the first one. Even though, if you're willing and able to look past this element of the game, I do think they're worth playing in sequence. Take the content warning on these games seriously. Especially the first one. Fear and Hunger is a game which I ended up really enjoying. While there's a lot working against you, I don't actually think the first game is especially hard or grueling. It's a difficult game, but it's not the hardest game I've ever played. And much like Kingsfield, once I finally felt like I had the game's mechanics in my grasp, I was able to roll right over the rest of the game. I had a great time, and I was excited to start the second game. So as soon as the credits were over, I booted up the sequel. Oh, last thing for real. Just for those out there who have already played the game, I know about Dungeon Knights mode. I didn't touch it. It's a really funny joke. I don't want to talk about it in specific, because I don't want to spoil the joke for people who haven't played the game yet. Okay, Fear and Hunger 2, Termina. The first Fear and Hunger took me 12 hours to go from complete beginner to having a deep enough understanding of how the game works to get the game's A ending which left me feeling satisfied that I'd seen what I wanted to of the game. It was hard, brutal, but compelling, and I never got stuck on any one part for more than an hour or so. I assumed that walking into the second game with my knowledge from the first would make the second game easier. That's usually how these things work. The first Shin Megami Tensei game I played, 4, took me a long time to learn, but by the time I moved on to games like Strange Journey, I had that knowledge framework in place, so the experience was less daunting, even though SMT4 is one of the easier games in the series. Fear and Hunger 2, Termina, lifted me in the air and broke me over its knee, like it was Bane and I was a poor defenseless Batman. It's not that Fear and Hunger 2 is objectively harder. In fact, if you know what you're doing, there are a number of changes which made the experience much friendlier. Saving can be done reliably by sleeping in a number of safe beds in the game without requiring a coin flip at all. Unlike the first game, where the only truly safe bed was found in one of the game's final areas, and which required beating the skin granny boss the first time you use it, you have one of these safe beds right on the train you begin in. Soul Stones, your skill points, aren't reliant solely on RNG anymore. While you do still acquire them as random drops, you can also cut off enemies' heads with a bone saw, and trade those heads in at a new god's altar for Soul Stone shards. Every three heads means one new Soul Stone. And you don't even need to use those Soul Stones on a dead enemy body to turn them into skill points anymore. You don't need to find a special hidden altar to use your Soul Stones, either. You gain access to the skill table every time you sleep. The coin flips are downplayed significantly. While they're still present, they aren't as common as they once were. And sometimes failing one won't even result in a one-hit kill, it'll just result in a powerful but survivable attack. 
This was technically the case in the first game as well, but I can count the number of times I actually survived a coin flip attack there on one finger. Even losing a limb isn't as big of a deal as it was in the first game. You actually get several opportunities to fully heal and regrow your limbs. As there are certain ritual circles throughout the game, the ones which look like they have a partially complete star in them, which let you draw a specific Old God's Mark, fully healing you and restoring your limbs. Do you want to guess which of those things the game tells you? The correct answer is none of them! Because of how little the game tells you, I found Fear and Hunger 2, Termina, to be a far, far, far more difficult game than the first one. My skill points were few and far between, I was constantly running out of healing items and of mind-restoring items. I lost limbs. I lost party members. I lost essential time because of mistakes that I'm now able to look back and laugh at. This game was a grueling, miserable experience. Remember how I said the first game took me 12 hours to get the true ending? This one took me over 40. Part of that is because of the expanded scope of the game. The game completely ditches its randomly generated map elements, instead creating one cohesive and rather expansive open world town for you to explore. The setting has moved from a medieval fantasy to 1942 Eastern Europe, set just a few months after the end of this world's version of World War II. Instead of four playable characters, there are eight, each with their own unique skills and drawbacks. Levi, for example, is an ex-soldier and is therefore much more competent with firearms, but because of his experiences in the war, he's also a heroin addict. And if you aren't able to keep him in constant supply, you'll be fighting his withdrawal. Olivia is a botanist, and because of this she's able to scavenge more types of plants than other characters can and craft them into more useful medicines. She also has a condition which keeps her legs from working properly, and so she is essentially starting the game with two limbs down, and will need a wheelchair to get around the town. So on and so forth with the other six characters. You begin the game on a train to the town of Preheval, with each character having their own unique reasons for being there. Before you can make it into the town, however, all 14 passengers on the train have a dream where a strange man atop a tower, standing in front of a moon with a cruel grin on it, tells them that they are contestants in the Termina Festival, and that they have just three days to whittle the living contestants down to one, and then reach the large tower in the town, or else they'll all meet with a terrible fate. Okay, we need to talk about the other elephant in the room. Termina? Did he just say Termina? And there's a three-day time limit? And a moon with a face? Is this whole thing just a big Majora's Mask reference? Oh man, you ain't seen nothing yet. Here's a few statements about Fear and Hunger and its sequel which are just true. The word Termina is in it. The moon from Majora's Mask is in it. Preheval is eerily reminiscent of Silent Hill. The Silent Hill Dark World is in it. The soundtrack is described in the Steam description as Yamaoka Punk. I'll leave it to the viewer's discretion whether it deserves it or not, I quite liked it. Griffith is in it. Jotaro Kujo is in it. There's a lamp from Bloodborne in it. The King in Yellow is in it. The school from Silent Hill is in it. So are the creepy zombie infants. The facehugger from Alien is in it, and it's somehow more phallic than ever. The Dark Continent from Hunter Hunter is in it. Blue, green, and red herbs from Resident Evil are in it. Mixed herbs from Resident Evil are in it. The clown from Terrifier is in it. Black Philip from The Witch is in it. That scene from Silent Hill 2 where you see Pyramid Head staring at you from the other side of a gate is in it. One of the gods in the game is named Valtiel, sharing a name with a recurring god from the Silent Hill series. The Human Centipede is in it. The Happy Mask Salesman is... he's in it. One of the characters in Termina is a journalist who has covered wars. One of the bosses, Rancid the Circle, is explicitly a creature from the manga Villus. This one even says used with permission in the credits, which is the only way I know it's referencing something. I have no idea how that's pronounced. Sound off in the comments. Finally, one of the gods, Almer, 
descended onto earth as a mortal and gathered twelve disciples before being betrayed and killed, spending three days dead before rising again. That's right. They plagiarized Jesus Christ. I didn't know that was possible. All of that is without even getting into the ones that are more arguable. Like the way Don, the playable doctor class in Termina, bears a striking resemblance to Daniel Denkovsky, aka The Bachelor, from Pathologic. Or the way blue butterflies are used to signify the influence of an outer god, something which is specifically used by the Persona games in regards to Philemon. And these are just the references I personally picked up on and then remembered off the top of my head while writing this script. I don't actually hate this, any of this. The game certainly wears its influence on its sleeve, but it also uses all of these things in a different way from the original material. Take for example the core premise of the game, the Termina Festival. A giant moon hangs overhead, and the game only gives you a three day time limit. That could be used as shorthand for a lot of different mechanics. A time rewinding feature, a constant clock putting pressure on the player, and so on. But in practice, Fear and Hunger 2 doesn't do any of these things. There's no time loop mechanic in Termina, and there's no constant clock ticking down to put pressure on the player. The only thing that actually moves time forward is sleeping in a bed, which, unfortunately, also happens to be the only reliable way to save the game. Each of the game's three days are split into three time spans, morning, afternoon, and night. Each time you sleep and save, you move time forward, and the state of the world changes. NPC placement, quest progress, certain stores being open, and so on. The time mechanic is actually more similar to Deathloop than it is Majora's Mask in that way. Since once you've moved into a new period, you have all the time in the world to stay there. Because sleeping is also the primary way of saving the game, this gives you only eight reliable saves to use throughout a whole run. That's an incredibly limited resource, and so the game leaves it up to you to determine how much progress you feel like you need to make before you're comfortable using one of your precious saves. Not to mention that the town gets more dangerous with every passing day. In this way, the borrowed elements taken from other games don't feel stolen because they're being used in an entirely new way, an entirely new context. It reminds me of how the Soulsborne games decided to just take the brand of Sacrifice from Berserk whole cloth because Berserk was such a heavy point of inspiration, but used it in a new way, a new context. I don't think it detracts from the experience recognizing so many things in it, because they always feel more like they're quoting the original source than stealing from it. But it is kind of shocking just how blatant a lot of these references are, and I could see it putting some people off. There's an expression that says that good art borrows, great art steals, but I've never seen anything take that to heart quite like Fear and Hunger does. There are two other methods of saving, Books of Enlightenment and drawing a Fear and Hunger mark in a ritual circle, but these are not reliable. Both are a limited resource, and reliant on RNG at that. In the save I finally used to beat the game, I got a whopping one Book of Enlightenment in the entire run. Using the mark of the god of fear and hunger in the correct ritual circles, the ones that look like they have a fractal spiral pattern in them, is more reliable because it only requires you to get a single skin bible to drop over the course of the game, but there are still only five of these ritual circles total, and more importantly, Drawing these marks is mutually exclusive with drawing Almer's mark in the same circles, which opens a portal network that operates as the game's fast travel system. That's a huge drawback, and a major consideration for whether that extra save is actually worth it. Many, many times, I made the mistake of getting greedy after an hour of progress, deciding I'd try to min-max my game just a little more, just do one or two more things before going back to the train to save in a safe place, only to get ambushed by a mini-boss and one-shot by a coin flip. The time pressure keeps you from using these beds to save scum your way through the game without relying on the same trick of coin flips the first game did to make beds an unappealing option. A lot of what I have to say about Fear and Hunger 2, I've already said about Fear and Hunger 1. The biggest difference between the games is just that I found the second one in order of magnitude more difficult and grueling than the first one was. 
I suspect that if you've watched this video and seen those few tips I mentioned right at the beginning, especially how you get soul stones in this one, you won't have that experience. See, my big mistake was thinking that my knowledge from the first game would help me in the second. In reality, it was the exact opposite. The only way I ever got soul stones in the first game was through random drops, and I didn't feel dramatically underpowered there, so I figured the four or five soul stones I got in the second game were just how the game worked. There are twice as many skills on the tree in the sequel, sure, but I figured that was just the game's way of doubling down on requiring the player to make hard choices. I was wrong. I was a fool. Using my knowledge from the first game led me to basically attempting to brute force the game as a challenge run on my first few attempts. There were plenty of other spots that got me too, of course. Carelessly stepping on a bear trap I'd successfully avoided over and over again, and losing both my legs after going more than an hour without saving. Stepping on a landmine and blowing up, losing an hour of progress again. Dying to a boss after finally figuring out how to progress. Falling into a spike pit trap, which didn't even give me a coin flip, it just killed me. Doing that again after successfully avoiding the first spike pit. I also think that, unlike the first game, Fear and Hunger 2 is a bit too talky, given how many times you'll end up seeing the same scenes over and over and over again. Take an early portion of the game where you talk to Prehebel's monstrous mayor. The first time you do this, you'll probably say something wrong and start a difficult boss fight for that point in the game. Eventually, you'll learn the right series of words to please him, and you'll walk away with the key you need to progress. The first time you successfully do this, it feels great, like you found a clever way around a boss fight. However, because this conversation only becomes available in the afternoon on the first day, this will be something that happens after your first save, something which marks having already gotten the other key to the city gates for me. I wanted to use the afternoon time slot to begin exploring the city, and so that meant every single time I died, I had to go all the way to the mayor's house and sit through the entire conversation again. Games that are based around replaying the same content over and over and over again to eventually make progress need to be very careful with their use of dialogue. Playing the same section of the game over and over again just feels inherently better than going through the same dialogue tree over and over again the same number of times. I spent a lot of time doing this. A lot of time. The flip side of this is that I think the story and lore built by Fear and Hunger 2 is stronger than the first games. While you don't need to play the first in order to understand the second, it's extremely cool to see what's become of this world like a thousand years later. There's also a lot of nods to the first game, not only with broader lore like the gods being the same as in the first game, but also more direct character references. As an example, one of the smaller connections is that you can find a book written by Enki, the playable Dark Priest character from the first game. The characters in the second game feel more like characters and less like archetypes. There are interesting details about them which you'll likely never come across unless you play as that character. One of the more interesting new characters is the Yellow Mage. Yellow Mages were a very memorable and dangerous recurring enemy in the first game, so making one playable in the sequel was a pretty brilliant idea. If you select the Yellow Mage as your playable character, you'll find some surprises in store for you right off the bat. Most of all that his backstory intro at the very beginning isn't just a few key story beats about his personal history. It plays out as a lengthy text adventure, as it tells the story of the character entering the same dungeon you explore in the first game. It also reveals that he's the only character of the main cast who knows what he's getting into, coming to Preheval to take part in the Termina Festival on purpose. A really cool idea you'll never even know about unless you start the game as this character. It also builds on the idea that the Yellow Mages were working for Rare in the first game, something which is hinted by Moonless hating them on sight, a reaction she has to any of the Moon God's followers. Overall, the second game feels like a more fully realized version of the first game's vision. Bigger in scope, deeper in gameplay, and more impressive both visually and in its music and sound design. Despite the increased scope of the game, Fear and Hunger 2 also has considerably fewer endings than the first game had. 
where the first game had five normal endings, graded E through A, and another four S-rank endings, only available on the game's hardest difficulty, Fear and Hunger 2 only has three endings, at least that I was able to find. The C ending, the B ending, and the A ending. One of these endings does have a small variation depending on which character you're playing as, but it's the same ending at heart. Between the lower number of endings, the shift in focus away from randomized map elements, and the longer runtime, it feels like Fear and Hunger 2 isn't designed with as much replayability in mind as the first game. While I could see playing Fear and Hunger 1 again resulting in a wildly different experience, at its heart, replaying the sequel would mean experiencing the same content again. That's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just a shift in focus. Fear and Hunger 1 is designed to be endlessly replayable, while Fear and Hunger 2 is built around a single, harrowing experience. I died. I lost progress. I wasted my saves. I ran out of time. I got a Book of Enlightenment and then died before using it because I tried to push forward like an idiot. I restarted. Playing this game was like trying to beat down a brick wall, with nothing but my forehead. Why was I doing this? Was I still having fun? Absolutely not. But there was something just captivating about this game. I couldn't look away. I couldn't put it down. Where the first game reminded me so much of Kingsfield, the game Fear and Hunger 2 reminded me the most of was, in fact, Pathologic. And no game since Pathologic 2 in 2019 has had a hold of me quite the way this game did. My near breaking point came around 30 hours into my time with the game. I'd finally, after days of grueling, tedious brute force, made it to the tower. I was in the endgame. Only, see, I hadn't been killing the other contestants, because they were my party members. This is one of the biggest changes from the first game. Yes, as in the first game, the other playable characters you do not select can become party members, which gives you a huge advantage for all of the same reasons it did in the first game. Unlike the first game, however, Fear and Hunger 2 isn't joking about the whole only one can survive thing. Two of the game's three endings, the two which involve reaching that tower at the end, require you to kill all 13 other contestants either in their human forms or as the monsters they'll eventually become, or else, at the very least, let them die in other ways. Not only will the door to the final boss not open if the other contestants are alive, those contestants in your party will immediately mutate into monsters when you try, turning your party members into a sudden boss rush, one you aren't prepared for without your party. When I realized what was actually before me, prospect of killing all my party members, and then killing all the other contestants, and then finally getting into the final boss room all by myself, it was just too much. I'd already resigned myself to not getting the true ending this time around, but I wanted to get an ending, any ending, to close this chapter. My character just wasn't strong enough. I had tried to play the second game with my strategy from the first, the entire time, and it had screwed me over. My resources were stretched too thin. I couldn't do it. I was crushed. It was 1am. I wanted to put this game behind me. I had forgotten what video games were. I restarted one more time. This was the time it finally clicked. There was a reason the game was trying to get me to kill the other contestants, and it wasn't just a narrative one. I was trying to play Termina too much like I had played the first game, and that was never going to work. See, remember how each contestant has their own unique skills? Well, those skills aren't just locked out for the other playthroughs. If you directly kill that contestant, you absorb their soul and unlock that skill tree. You don't only want to be killing contestants for the story and to reach the game's ending, you want to do it because one player character with the combined skills of two contestants is going to be exponentially more powerful than those two separate contestants would be as party members alone. Then, 
if you can get all 14 skill trees unlocked, your one player character will be the only party member you'll ever need. The most important of these for my build was the Yellow Mage skill tree because of two important skills. The first important skill is a dance, which makes all spells cast progressively more powerful with each passing turn of combat, an absolute necessity for late game bosses. The second is the Spice Forge. The Spice Forge gives you three spices, red, green, and blue, which can be put onto three of your spells. The green spice lets you automatically cast one spell as a free action at the beginning of combat, something which can be put onto the Blood Golem spell to permanently give yourself a powerful party member who will always be at maximum health and mind at the beginning of combat. The blue spice lets you cast a greater version of a spell, a more powerful version for half the mind cost. The third spice, red, lets you double cast a spell, and when put on an AoE, this can be powerful enough to knock the limbs off of enemies in their first turn, before they've even had a chance to move. Of course, the game doesn't tell you what any of these skills do until you've actually bought them, so experimenting is the only way to find out what works. Or let someone else tell you. Another powerful advantage is the game's agility stat. If your agility is above 16, then you can get an extra action every turn, essentially doubling your damage output, which can already be doubled by a double cast. At this point, you still have a bottleneck as casting takes up your limited mind, so you'll need one more thing to make you a perpetual killing machine. The last item you'll need is the trinket, the Betel Stone. The Betel Stone's description just says that it's leaking out a trickle of magic, which doesn't give you much idea, if any, of what the trinket's effect actually is. What the Betel Stone is actually doing is restoring a little bit of mind every turn. Ten or so. If you're using the right spells, using the Spice Forge to make your most powerful spells or heals cheap, or simply guarding on turns when you don't need to attack to stay alive and intact, then you can use this trinket to keep your mind perpetually at cap. If you're the only character in the party, hunger is never going to be an issue. While my resources were stretched a little thin when split between four characters, now I had all of those resources at my disposal to keep just my player character alive. With these systems in mind, with these advantages in my favor, my character had turned from a weakling into an absolute wrecking ball. My final save became a revenge tour, where I killed nearly everything in my path before they could even get an attack off. These aren't the only advantages I used, mind you, but with this much strength as a starting point, I was able to snowball my character into an absolute god of destruction. The only point where the game became challenging again were those same final few bosses that I'd gotten stuck at before. I only died twice in my entire final playthrough once to the game's optional super boss, and once to one of the game's final bosses when he reflected my own spell back at me. It's not that the game's final hours were trivialized, either. By the time I dealt the killing blow to the final boss in this game, I was missing both arms and one leg. Again, my point here isn't to tell you that this is the definitive way to beat this game. It's to explain what the appeal of this game is. I'm sure there are other ways to overcome this game's challenge. In fact, I know there are because I found people online talking about ways to perfect a run where all 14 contestants made it out alive. This build was just what finally worked for me after dozens of hours of trial and error and a healthy amount of searching the internet for any tips and details on a largely undocumented game. But once I finally found a way that worked for me, I was able to roll over so much of the game which had given me so much trouble for so long. This is why Fear and Hunger, and its sequel, are worth playing. Despite the brutal odds stacked against you, once you find a clever way to shift the balance of the game in your favor, it feels incredible. These games are hard, yes, but what they're testing isn't Twitch reflexes. It's your ability to internalize dozens of systems, and figure out how they can be used to your advantage, to overcome absolutely overwhelming odds. As in the first game, there are many, many strange and inexplicable things that are a mystery to me. Take the Irrational Obelisk. 
This strange object can be found in a store in the town, made from dozens of shirts. As far as I can tell, you can't kill it. I spent a lot of time doing thousands of points of damage per round to it, and it never died. At the same time, it can't kill you, at worst doing a few points of mind damage, and no health damage at all per round. Eventually, though, I realized, with my Battlestone and Guarding, I could outheal its mind damage each round. That means if I were low on mind, either from casting spells that were too powerful, or just the constant drain being placed on you, I could just go here, spend a few rounds regenerating, and run away from the fight when my mind was near full. If I used lifesteal magic, then I could do the same thing for my health points, too. That means two of the game's main resources, health and mind, were essentially trivialized. Is that the purpose of the irrational obelisk? I don't know. Maybe there's something else to it I never found, but does it matter? That was how I used the obelisk, and it worked for me. These games are hard. They're brutal, they're unfriendly, they don't tell you anything, and they feel like they're actively trying to work against you. And yet, if you stick with them, there's something really special here. Something you can't get, at least not in this dosage, anywhere else. This isn't the only game where I've had this experience. Like I said before, I think there are parallels to be drawn to other games. The aimless wandering of Kingsfield, the need to internalize complicated overlapping combat systems of Shin Megami Tensei, or the oppressive, overwhelming resource demands of Pathologic. What makes this game special is the way that it uses all of these things together, and requires you to spin so many plates at the same time. Playing these games, while often a painful experience, I've been reminded of mechanics from so many other games, and it's given me a new appreciation for why so many mechanics that are often frustrating, like limited rare save points, can in fact be valuable to the experience. Playing these games gave me a hunger to go pick up other games I haven't played in a while, like Shin Megami Tensei V, because I was stuck on some boss or other, and to give them another go, with a new approach in mind. It gave me a hunger to seek out other complicated mechanical experiences, and see if I can manipulate them in my favor, the same way I manipulated Fear and Hunger. I'm not sure if you should play Fear and Hunger. It's not for everyone. And if you've made it this far, then you likely already know whether it's for you or not. I wouldn't blame anyone for hearing what this game involves and choosing to steer clear of it. But if it sounds like it's for you, then I think, even knowing what you know now, you should give it a try. Fear and hunger isn't for everyone. And it isn't trying to be. It was, however, for me. I'm glad I played these games, and I think I'll carry them with me for a long time to come. Thank you.